It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 346 of Science on Top. Today is Tuesday the 19th of November 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And let's start off with an announcement because we're coming up to the end of the year and usually our last episode is a look back at the stories we liked and the ones we didn't like, what was memorable, that sort of thing. And we're still going to do that this year, but... We want to know the stories that you liked, what struck a chord with you, the listeners. So if you go to check out our new website, it's all modernized and updated and black, uh, at scienceontop.com, you can record a short message for us and send an email by the contact form there. Or of course, you can hit us up on Facebook or Twitter or on Patreon if you're a, a patron of ours. But uh, just drop us a note, say what science news you liked this year, and even if we didn't talk about it, there's plenty of stuff we didn't cover that was still newsworthy, so let us know your thoughts, and we might even cover it on the last show. Uh, We'll try and put a list up as well of some of the highlights from this year too, so you can choose from them if you like. So scienceontop.com slash contact for all the ways to get in touch with us. Now, let's begin with a look at Danuvius guggenmosi, which was a great ape that lived 11.6 million years ago in southern Germany, and it has just been formally described in the journal Nature. But what makes this discovery so exciting, Penny, is what it suggests about walking upright and our human ancestors, isn't it? It is, and it's, look, as anyone who's been listening for a long time, knows I love a good evolutionary biology human evolution story and I really like thinking about you know evolution and how it happens and one of our traits as humans is being bipeds so because it seems to differentiate us from um, the other apes it's something that we think is quite special and it's something we're quite interested in I'm sure there's other traits that we could trace back but when did this start why did it start how are we different? What happened that let us do this? It's interesting to trace it back and to see how the, I hate to use the word pre-adaptations because that implies that evolution was always going towards, you know, one species of uh-huh. ape becoming biped. But Yeah, like as if it's fated because it's not that at all. But, you know, what were the, I guess, stepping stones or building blocks that led to this? So this ape... Um, Danuvius guggenmosi was, yeah, as Ed says, 12 million years ago. And it wasn't, it was a, an ancestor of humans and other apes. So it's not a human ancestor. It's not a hominin. It's, it's a common ancestor. Blah, sorry. A, blah. Easy for you to say. <laughs> not easy for me to say at all. It's a common ancestor of us and the apes. And so if you look at chimps and even other kinds of um, apes, you can often see there's kind of, a, not bipedalism, but like, you know, orangutans in trees will walk around on their hind legs and there's a lot of brachiation or upright postures. Um, sort of like the knuckle dragging kind of. The knuckle dragging kind of thing, but also swinging by your arms from a tree puts your body in an upright kind of position rather than think like a dog, which is really on all fours. So, and um, so what they think this particular ape ancestor did, uh, which was in Europe, um, was maybe what they call extended limb clambering. So it's different from what we know from other creatures. So they actually think instead of swinging from branches, like I described, like if you imagine a gibbon or something, or sort of walking around cautiously on a branch, is kind of doing a bit of both. It's using arms and legs really equally. So, and they can understand this. I've no idea how from looking at its toe bones and its shin bones. Like, again, I'm always in awe of how we can look at that um, and 
get that. But it seemed to have, um, you know, forelimbs suited to life in the trees, but also lower limbs, which are suited to sort of extended postures as a biped. So not fully a biped like humans are, but an adaptation which lets it be upright while at the same time it's still good for treetop life. And it's interesting, our forelimbs are not so different from chimp forelimbs. Like in a way we're still suited in our upper bodies for life in the trees. Um, It's our lower bodies that are very much not. We can't Mm -hmm. grip with our feet. We're very much walkers. Um, So what I think is interesting is that this ape is so ancient, it's – the ancestor of other apes that are definitely not bipeds in the same way we are. But if we want to trace that particular pathway back, even at this 12 million years ago, we can see some of the traits that maybe allowed bipedalism to evolve, um, which I think is really, really fascinating because the really compelling evidence for actual upright walking comes only from 4.4 million years old, um, which is um, Artipithecus. So between 12 million and 4 million, I guess a lot has, was going on. Yeah. It's, it's the whole the God of the gaps sort of thing or, or mm. the missing links or like, you know, well, what happened before Artipithecus? And we can say, well, actually, if you look back to 11.6 million years ago, we can see the beginnings of that like presumably this is not as advanced or or as clear bipedalism as what artipithecus oh definitely and it 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 would this ape denuvius wouldn't have walked on the ground Mm. you know Mm. like we do but yeah but just to see oh okay yeah i guess you can see how those traits could eventually evolve or you know the precursors to a more advanced form of bipedalism or not advanced you know what i mean yeah, um, more developed form. Yeah. yeah. When you mentioned the um, the what little actual evidence there is, it reminded me of the Denisovans. With the, mm. you know, we know we, we oh, like two teeth and a right a bone, yeah. finger bone. That's it. Yeah. That's that's all we we've actually found of them and things you know other things that they've left in campsites and stuff. But you know, it's amazing what that that always blows my mind as well. Just that extrapolation from from that evidence. Uh, mm. But but as we've seen with I guess with dinosaurs back back in the day, you know that that can they can extrapolate I guess yeah. the wrong way as well. I mean we had we had dinosaurs in museums that turned out to be combination of actually completely different species all put mm. together. And obviously this is before DNA testing and all that sort of stuff. Not that there's a whole lot of DNA that we can use with, with <laughs> no. fossils, um, but yeah, it does make me wonder. You know, I, I just I, I'm always just blown away by that Dennis Ovens thing. How how on earth, from a finger bone and two teeth, they, they've mm-hmm. been able to con- construct what we think we know. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, this these discover this um to bring it back to the Denuvius one. There's actually a lot more uh, remains found than the Dennis Ovens, for example. Um, I think so. There are three. Um, bodies that they found like three partial skeletons yeah wasn't there a, a huge clump of them not clump like they were all found in a pit or something yeah it's in um like yeah a clay pit sort of thing um near the town of forzen in southern germany uh so they found i think two females and one male uh and from that they've got uh elements partial skeleton elements of mouth vertebrae and long bones um uh, so there's an adult left femur, um, or two adult left femurs, big toe and teeth, juvenile teeth, and a middle finger bone. Thirty-seven specimens in total. Mm. But, uh, so some stuff went down there in that pit, <laughs> or, yeah. or, or was it a burial pit, maybe, or something? But yeah. But the, but the, the, it, it also makes me wonder, like in terms of the evidence that left. And and bring, sorry to bring up the Denisovans again, but mm. if there's so little left of that species, then then the, the, it's very very possible that there would have been other examples of of you know divergent evolution taking place. That there might have been other 
species that were also sure. upright walkers that we just have never found evidence for. And that's the big mystery of all the things that there are no skeletons remaining of, but were, yeah, different species or different animals, as you say. Yeah, it's... So is it that di divergent or convergent evolution? Convergent, convergent is when the same thing evolves in multiple different uh, scenarios by itself. Right. I think okay. that's what I meant. Yeah. No, it's very cool. I just... 12 million years ago and we can determine how they acted, uh, mm. how, what they were able to do, and that we can even find their remains. I think it's just extraordinary that we can find any remains from more than a few million years ago. Just boggles the mind. Well, let's move on. And I think a lot of people would agree that going into space would be pretty cool. Virgin Galactic already has more than 600 rich people that have paid the $250,000 ticket price for a 90-minute suborbital jaunt. But spaceflight is not without its health risks. It causes muscle atrophy, bone weakness, cardiovascular issues, eyesight disorders, nasal congestion, sleep disturbance, and let's not forget excess flatulence. But now researchers, that's absolutely true. You can look that up. You fart like a leaf blower. <laughs> 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 Thanks for that visual. <laughs> That's, well, yeah. But now researchers have found another more serious health risk from human spaceflight. Stagnant or backwards blood flow in the internal jugular vein. Lucas, oh, that sounds pretty bad. <laughs> not good. It's not good. So um, I was going to give a, 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 a brief summary of the, uh, which I've already done now, the 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 things we know, oh. you know, uh, health issues in, in space. and, and it, it, I like just gave the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty you, of other ones. You did. And I, I think I think what's really – it's one of those things for me that that, um, that really shows the importance of things like the International Space Station, which really this is why it exists. It's, it's about figuring out what the implications are mm. for long-term space travel. If we, if we consider human – space flight potentially say to mars you're going to be looking minimum six to eight months one way to get there it's assumed that in all likelihood the first you know mission or missions perhaps might be sort of a round trip without a landing because that's a lot easier to mm -hmm. do technologically speaking so then you're looking you know potentially you know double double that you're looking 16 months 17 months or more um, for that period of time. Now, this problem that you mentioned here, um, this has developed in some some astronauts. It was actually six out of eleven that participated in the study. That's high. That's a high incidence, yeah. right? That's 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 that's, that's 50, almost 50, half. Yeah. So so, and it, it was shown to to develop in as little as fifty days, right? So under two months is is when this can occur and it can occur with with different levels of severity so the internal jugular vein is a major blood vessel that runs down the neck from the brain its role is to take blood away from the brain the, the blood is pumped up there arterial blood's pumped up there and then as it's deoxygenated deoxygenated oh, put my teeth back in um it, it runs down this vein now on earth uh as penny was talking about before walking upright um gravity takes care of this so if you've, ever, if you've ever stood on your head, I haven't done it for a long time, <laughs> but if you've ever done it, uh, and I, I guess most people have done it at some point in their lives, if you do it for, for more than a few minutes, your, your head kind of starts, it, it feels heavy, throbby. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's not a pleasant feeling. And this is something that, that is known to happen with astronauts, that they, not just blood, but basically all of, they, they have a water retention problem in their, in their upper body. And it causes their legs to 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 lose volume from from that um, you know from from the liquids are sort of hanging around the the, the upper body, um, and they uh, I think you mentioned before things like um, nasal congestion and, and puffiness and so forth is a is a well known thing that you you deal with as an astronaut. So um, this is another issue where this blood that should be flowing down the neck aided by gravity, isn't happening. And in some cases, not only can it stop, 
it can go the other way. So one of the actual one of one of the um, astronauts who was involved in this study actually developed thrombosis, which is when they got a blockage in this internal jugular vein, um, and 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 they had to then be on um, uh, medication for the rest of their mission because that that that's obviously a, quite a serious problem. So there'll be more things. There's no doubt about it. There will be more things that are that are shown over time because it just so happened that this was something that was selected to be studied. Um, yeah. We've only got we've got a sample of eleven here, six that were affected by it. It seems to be something we need to keep an eye on. But it's one of those things that there's more and more evidence that prolonged um, uh, space flight without some sort of uh, stand in for gravity is is going to have serious consequences for human health. So we we do need to sort these things out before we can do any long trips. Going to the to the moon, not such a big deal. That's you know basically days away. That's that's we can do that. Um, when you're on a planet, depending on how large it is, how much mass it has, um, you know there there is gravity on Mars. It's 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 a lot weaker than the gravity on Earth, but it's about one third the gravity from memory. Um, the Earth obviously, uh, sorry, the uh, Moon's a lot less than that, that, but there is gravity there. So there would probably be a tipping point at which, um, uh, you know, tipping the, point. Yes, thank you. <laughs> at, at which uh, you know this this um, problem might start to assert itself. Uh, but yeah, what do, what do you do? Um, you basically we need something like these spinning structures that, that can have a bit of a, um, a centrifuge sort of effect, mm. centrifugal yeah. effect, where where um, and and there's been you know some recent um, uh, work done on that, just looking at the overall size of one of those structures that would it really be necessary in order to maintain you know some some degree of norm- normality for for the human systems. But the problem, of course, with that is you can then introduce other problems. Like if it's if it's quite a small structure, and and I say like I say small in in, in Basically, it's, it's a relative term, right? Small might be something about the size of a football field, for example. Um, like the that, ISS. Yeah, maybe. So something that that small could serve the purpose as a, as a rotating structure. To, uh, but, you know, the smaller it is, basically, the faster it has to spin. If you have a much larger structure, it doesn't have to spin as fast. And the problem with a small structure spinning fast is, of course, it gets disorienting because then you've got inner ear problems and, and basically you, you can end up getting a form of motion sickness. Um, mm. So that, that produces problems as well because realistically you could, you could be looking at having to spend sort of a third of your day or something like that in such a structure in order to avoid you know, these types of issues cropping up. So, yeah, it's, it's certainly very interesting and, and nothing, nothing that's – yeah, uh, in in the proposals thus far for any of the missions to Mars, have got anything like that sort of structure involved in them. Um, the, so we don't have a, a, a gravity stand-in. Uh, a lot of the other things that that have been um, shown to be problematic for humans, like for example, cosmic rays, is one of the biggest ones. Um, we can deal with that just by having shielding, and shielding, in fact, couldn't just be you know water. You can have water stored in the walls of the spaceship, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. would be enough shielding. And it's also quite handy because you need water. <laughs> um, so, but of course, water is very heavy. But anyway, there's all sorts of things that we've got to think about. But yeah, but also, as you say, the whole point of doing space research and things like that are to learn these things. Yes, and being a pioneer or an explorer of any kind is not a luxury activity. That's the risk you take to do something unique and that could advance humanity and civilization and yeah. all those sorts of things. Yeah. But it does, as I say, it does highlight the importance of the ISS um, because really that's one of its fundamental missions is to study this stuff. Human guinea pigs. Mm. And uh, um, they have and- had rodents up there. Well, yeah. rodents, uh, well, they've with, had guinea pig uh, guinea pigs as well as human guinea pigs, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, unlike guinea pigs, some people really don't like to eat their veggies. And Dr. Jennifer Smith and colleagues from the University of Kentucky School of Medicine has looked at genetic reasons for why some people just can't bear to eat their greens, 
Penny, what did she find? Yeah, apparently it is in the genes. So I guess one of the things about veggies is they often have a bit of a bitter taste, um, which, look, as an adult, I really don't mind. Mm. Um, and we'll have a think later on about why that might be. But um, we know that people perceive tastes in different ways. Like the one that often we've talked about before is coriander, which to some people, me included, tastes like soap. It just tastes horrible. I hate coriander. And it's quite trippy to think how two people can be eating something and yet it will actually taste so different to them. Like not just, oh, it's the same flavour but we perceive it differently but actually it's di- different. Like it, it's a different sensation. It's not just um, a preference. So, um, so what the taste of vegetables thing seems to be is it's a gene, it, it seems to come down to a gene which is a tasting gene. It's called TAS2R38, which basically makes a protein that goes into our taste receptors, which allows us to taste bitterness. So even though that idea that you might have seen of, you know, a map of the tongue with different areas which taste different things is not true. There are definitely taste receptors on our tongue which can taste, you know, salty or bitter or that umami, MSG kind of taste or sweet. Mm -hmm. So you can have um, different variants of the gene. One variant makes you not very sensitive um, to bitter tastes from certain chemicals. Um, If you have one copy of the not sensitive one, but another one, which is called PIV, you can perceive it. But people who get two copies of the really highly sensitive gene um, or allele on this gene um, can be called super tasters and they can find those foods really bitter. And basically vegetables or things like that will taste worse to them than they will to other people. And avoiding bitter food is actually usually a pretty sensible thing to do in evolutionary terms because often the chemicals that produce bitterness are produced by the plant to, um, you know, warn like off poison. animals. This is poison. Don't eat it. Mm. Like, don't eat me. However. I don't even taste good. Go away. <laughs> I'm not letting my children know about this. <laughs> it's not just an excuse because... There's other things that it affects other than your leafy greens, which are renowned for not being great. Beer, coffee, and dark chocolate. So, All of um, which, and coriander, are things that my wife dislikes intensely. Well, she could be a super taster. I think so. How does she feel about broccoli and leafy greens? She's okay with that. and and Yeah. Yeah, I read that in the study as well, that that could be a reason why some people just avoid you know, those sorts of greens. But, yeah, um, I, I do. And my, my oldest um, offspring as well also has this, you know, aversion mm. to, to these things. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it makes me wonder whether could, in, like you mentioned a moment ago about um, some, some vegetables in nature have got mm. that taste and it's a warning you know, it's a mm. warning for, for us not to eat them. I wonder if some of these vegetables developed in certain regions, um, some dangerous vegetables that were bitter developed in certain regions, which led to some selection of these um, super tasted genes in the populations of those regions, mm. which then over time is oh, homogenized across. Yeah. It'd be fascinating to look at. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was so. So it was the which combination was it of the the genes? Um, two the copies two? of the PAV, a little, right? Um, or like so, yeah. They're just getting like a double dose of that protein that allows bitter tastes to mm. be detected. But it is it is interesting thinking about it. Like when you say your wife and son don't like it, but she manages to eat veggies because. I guess also, you know, we're often told you need more leafy greens. No matter how much you're eating, you probably need more. Um, But if they actually taste foul, people are unlikely to do that. Like, Yeah. So it would be interesting if dietary guidelines could, you know, give maybe advice on ways of preparing or cooking them that can help. 
Yeah. Is there a way of removing the bitterness? Yeah. If if we had evolved this this um, you know aversion to to bitter foods um, because they were dangerous for us, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense that like the comment about us it, like we're really fighting an uphill battle to get people to eat healthily if things are not tasty because we are genetically hardwired to seek out the things that are worse for us because in nature they come in such yeah. small quantities like anything that's sweet really really it's mm-hmm. really rare in nature right so not a lot of sweet things that we're going to come across in our in our you know uh, our, our foraging kind of existence um but also fat like you know going after fat that's something that we would have loved to find when we did hunt and kill some beast that uh that we cooked and, and we got the fat out of it but but you know we've just got such high access to these things it's a it's a it's it's really no wonder we have such such problems with with food sure. and obesity agreed yeah, you can't blame it all on your genetic predisposition to not like broccoli. Mm. Especially <laughs> not if you also like beer. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. true. <laughs> mm. All right. Well, let's have a look at a uh, potential energy breakthrough. And researchers in Sweden have created a molecule that they say can trap energy from the sun and keep it in reserve so it can be released on demand in the form of heat even decades after it was captured. So, Lucas, how does this work? Do we know any details about this? Oh, man. Uh, how does it work? <laughs> I don't know. The, the, uh, the, Magic! The stories, science! <laughs> the, 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 science! Uh, the stories are very vague on on the how part. It just says that mm-hmm. it, it's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Okay, that's good. These are very, very uh, um, numerous you know, yeah. molecules for us to get a hold of. Uh, sorry, um, elements, I should say. Um, so that's good. So the, the first thing in its favour is that it's made of things it, like a lot of other energy storage things happen to be made of materials that are really rare and expensive. Yeah. So that's that's a tick. That's a good tick there. Apparently, mm-hmm. this this team has spent almost a decade working on on this this particular um, combination. And and apparently, when it's when it's hit by sunlight, it draws in the the, the energy from the sun and holds it. Uh, until a catalyst is introduced that triggers its release of heat. So that so far sounds pretty cool. A couple of problems. One, um, heat by itself, because it doesn't go into any detail of how much heat it gives off, um, we could be talking about like, you know, warm. You know, it could be like warm to the Mm. touch. It could be Mm. like 40 degrees or something. Not enough to boil water to generate steam to turn turbines or something like that. Right. Exactly. So this made me think of things like Cassini and, um, you know, the uh, Mars um, uh, Curiosity rover, which is powered by um, radioactive decay. So they've got they've got um, uh, radioactive uh, elements in there, which is plutonium, which is just decaying away, producing heat. And it's the heat that's harvested to recharge the batteries. Um, So. You know, it lasts a very, very long time. Now, we don't have a lot of plutonium that's to the grade that's required for that. That's actually been one of the problems with producing new uh, new spacecraft. But um, everything's relative, right? You put something that generates heat into the vacuum of space that's really, really cold, and the differential is important. That's really what can drive, um, you know, your, your recharging and things and so forth. But if it's if it doesn't have much of a differential between the the atmosphere around it, this molecule, um, how could it be used? And and the team actually said, they don't know, they're not sure. They they said the real key here is the catalyst part of it where the this molecule that they build is able to retain this energy basically indefinitely. So you look at, say, so, so what's in phones right now is lithium-ion batteries mainly, right? So um, so all of our consumer electronics have got lithium-ion batteries. Now, depending on how you treat them and, and, and the temperature ranges they're exposed to and cycles and so forth, you're going to get anywhere between a couple of years to maybe a maximum of about 10 years out of lithium-ion batteries, uh, depending on how they're used, um, regardless of even if you're using them. So a battery such as that just simply will not store energy beyond that sort of time frame, whereas this could be indefinite 
We don't quite know yet, but the catalyst part is really, really interesting. So I kind of keep an eye out for these stories because this is one of the holy grails for, for mm-hmm. us. It's really important for for technology, but also anything we do in the future that, that that's not reliant on pumping carbon into the atmosphere um, is, is going to involve storage of energy. Um, there's no point in having things like wind and solar and wave generation and all the other renewable energy stuff if you can't use the energy when you need it. So we need to be able to store it, which is why batteries are one of the big holy grails at the moment. Um, there's a whole lot of other things, and there's other teams that are also working on on other types of molecules that are that are able to to harvest um, uh, energy and and hold it for periods of time. But this is so far one of the most important ones that's come out of these types of studies is just the length of time and the fact that it's a catalyst that releases it. The other thing I like about this one is it's it's not just a battery, it's not just a storage mechanism. There's also the possibility of turning it into a coating that they can then you know, apply to like a transparent windows or something. So it stores the energy up during the day when the sun's shining on it. And then at night it releases the heat to warm the house up uh, when the sun's not shining. Uh, right. Or it could be covering um, electric cars, for example, and generating energy for them. But there's just so many questions we don't know the answer to. So, and unfortunately... All I can find on, on this seems to all come from a Bloomberg Business Week article. I can't find any other mm. researchers talking about it. Every other article claims Bloomberg Business Week as their source. So I think this was kind of a either an exclusive interview or something or a press release that's been yeah. done to get them, you know, some yes. market share, some interest, maybe some investors or something like that interested in it. So... Exciting, yes, but we'll wait and see. Again, everything wait and see. And, and just a, a footnote to that, um, they need investors, which is sometimes a bit of a red flag. Um, we're talking uh, commercial availability in somewhere between three to eight years. Mm, we've heard that many times before <laughs> as well. well. Yes. Um, so they're after $5 million of additional funding right now. So if you've got some cash lying around, maybe reach out. But, yeah, there are a few things there that are those red flags that, that you know, that we've heard many times before. Mm. All right. Well, I think that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web, scienceontop.com slash 346. Don't forget to let us know your top stories of 2019. And why not sign up to Patreon to help us out financially? Go to scienceontop.com for all that sort of information. And thank or, you. P- or, 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 or what? If, if you can't support financially, which is totally okay, please support us with ratings. Ratings are one of the, the biggest things that you can do to help us reach more people. Please rate us on whatever it is that you're listening. We're now on Spotify as well. Ratings and word of mouth. Tell your friends if, if someone's asking for a podcast recommendation. Don't say all the, the good ones. Say the <laughs> <right> one. <laughs> Tell them science on top. That's the one you want to be listening to. Well, thank you very much, Penny and Lucas, for joining me today. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on the top of the agenda. Join us then. It's real life imitating art. Two Breaking Bad wannabe professors busted for allegedly creating a meth lab in a university classroom in Arkansas. Police say they arrested doctors Terry David Bateman and Bradley Rowland from Arkansas's Henderson State University Friday following an investigation done in conjunction with school police. HSU telling ABC News that someone reported an undetermined chemical odor, which it says after testing, quote, indicated an elevated presence of benzyl chloride in a laboratory, a molecular compound that scientists say could be used in creating the drug. 
Bateman, seen here in this promotional video on the university's YouTube page, has been teaching at the school for over a decade. According to his school bio, he's always been interested in pharmaceuticals. Roland, who's been on staff for five years, was nicknamed Henderson Heisenberg by the school paper in 2014 after admitting he was a fan of the AMC hit show and crediting Breaking Bad's success with students becoming more interested in chemistry, saying, I feel like it was a wonderful recruiting tool. Both professors reportedly placed on administrative leave and under investigation. Well, teaching tool, huh? <laughs> I guess so. You could, you could put it that way, certainly, but best to be avoided, I think. Certainly yeah. was a teaching moment. Yes, yeah. yes, it, it yeah, certainly was. Mm. Thank, Thank you, Will.